This is the uh, Silver Lake History Collective interview of Lenny Bluett, and he's a longtime Silver Lake resident who now lives in the Cedar Lodge on Griffith Park. So, Boulevard. Do what? On Griffith Park Boulevard. On Griffith Park Boulevard, right. Not in the park. That would be right. a different situation. Right. <laughs> And uh, he's lived in Silver Lake for 30 years, but before that he had an illustrious career in film and also as a piano player. And singer. Pianist and, and singer. singer. Okay. So, um, where, it, uh, where were you born? You were born in Los Angeles, right? I was. My mother was a girl around this general area. My mother was May Henrietta. Well, you mean her married name or maiden name? Well, both. Well, May Henrietta Jones or May Henrietta Blewett. <laughs> and your father was Frederick? Frederick. And he was from... Texas. That's what I thought. Texas, yes. yes. Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, your father worked for many years for Buster Keaton? Yes, he was a driver for Buster Keaton, the actor. And your mother, what was her job? My mother was cook, housekeeper for Humphrey Bogart for so 30 years. you actually grew up around Humphrey Bogart? Oh, yes, yes. From the time I was 17, I played all his Christmas parties. <laughs> I got some stories I can tell you, but I can't tell. Oh, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, now, uh, where, where did you work first? Uh, you worked in, in, in films when you were very young? Yes, I worked in films when I was uh, 17, 18. One, my first film was with Eddie Cantor called Going to Town. It's a story he dreamed he was in Harlem, New York, and here we are, transported in costumes. According to his dream, in uh, native uh, attire, African attire, on a stage in Harlem, he's dreaming all this because they gave him some kind of a pill. Yeah, Eddie Cantor. And I was 17, and I had to get my Social Security card at 20th Century Fox. I'm very glad I got it now because that's you know coming in very handy. But as a kid, why do I have to go downtown L.A. and get a Social Security card, you know? <laughs> right. Anyway. So and that was 1937. Oh, okay. I remember it well. With Eddie Cantor, it's called Going to Town. And then I, and then I went from film to film, uh, including uh, a couple of films with Lena Horne. One was an Ethel Waters called Cabin in the Sky, Stormy Weather, and, um, and very prominently uh, you can see me in both of those films. And um, a film called When Strangers Marry with Kim Hunter and Robert Mitchum. I'm dancing, jitterbug dancing. And um, Several films uh, at my, I wasn't even out of my 20s yet, 21, you know, I wasn't even 21 yet. And uh, uh, I was just lucky to be a good jitterbug, what we call a jitterbug dancer. And I was tall and gangly, so they used me <laughs> quite a bit, quite a bit. Mm. Well, well that, uh, so did, did you, um, did you go into uh, World War II? No, I did not go into World War II, but I did go over to Hawaii at the request of a very wealthy man who asked me to, who I had played private parties for, who asked me to come to the Tripler General Hospital there in Hawaii and entertain the guys that were coming back from the war with no arms and no legs, just their bodies on a sheet of, I mean, not a sheet, but a... Gurney on a gurney and play for them and all they could do is smile. Oh. You know, they couldn't clap because they had no arms, no legs, just bodies. Some of, 
some, not all of them, but some of them, uh -huh. at Tripler General Hospital in, in Honolulu. Yeah. So did you pay any I did that uh, for two or three years. Uh -huh. And that, so that, that uh, excused me from going into active service. I also trained some trios and quartets in the music field while I was there. Mm -hmm. That kept me active and uh, out of the marching and getting into war itself, and that's what I wanted because because of Pearl Harbor, you know. Right. I will never forget that, and I haven't yet. And it's one of those one of those things to shoot up a beautiful, beautiful island like that, and uh, because my mother and I had gone over to Hawaii in 1951. She had never had a holiday or had been out of California and I decided to take her to Hawaii. Uh, at the, there was only two hotels at that time that you could stay at. One was the Royal, the Royal Hawaiian on the beach and the other one was the, oh, I forgot, I forget it now, not the Mauna Loa, the, um, but there's a photo up there of, of getting us off, we're getting off the plane. I took about 18 suits and all I wore the time I was there was just, uh, uh, what do you call it, just shorts uh -huh. and a shirt, <laughs> a flowered shirt. And I had 18 suits with me, but I didn't know. When you went to Hawaii, you didn't take all those clothes with you, but I had to dress up. And I was with my mother and I wanted to show her all the good things, you know. There's also a photo of her and, and Lauren Bacall when Bogart first married her when she was 21. Uh, he, they first met when she was 19 or 20. And he mm -hmm. married her and brought her to California and they were in that, the films together. And um, after, after you, were, um, you were at the hospital and, and so forth, uh, what did you do after that? Did you just have a regular like... Uh, music career? Yes, I came back home and I took a job in Westwood for two weeks and I ended up by staying there for ten years. <laughs> <laughs> right near the Mormon temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that job. And then, and then all through my career I did piano bars. That was very popular during that time. Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, Venice, everywhere, piano bars. And then in the 70s, I decided I, I wanted to go to Europe and see what was there. So in the late 70s, early 80s, I went to Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, and I started my European career there. And I worked in uh, um, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, all the uh, wonderful hotels there for about 10, 12 years. And then uh, I got a wonderful call to go to the best hotel in, in, in Morocco, which was in, not Casablanca, but in Marrakesh. And Robin Leach, the guy that used to talk about the Grand Hotels, uh -huh. in the world talked about that one and before I had signed my contract I heard him say on the television that if you ever go to Morocco you must go to the Mor to the hotel uh, in Marrakesh called uh, um, I think I just mentioned it to you um, the, the uh, oh. Mamounia the Mamounia Hotel in Morocco and uh, so I signed a contract for six months and when I got there I thought to myself oh my god I've never seen a hotel like this in my entire world it used to be a sultan's palace it was his own personal touch and I think he had a girl in every room I think probably <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it was a gorgeous gorgeous hotel and they, they and they had a bar there called the um, and it was called the Churchill Lounge where I played uh -huh. and his room is still they kept it it's still there called the Churchill 
and they only read it out to very ex exclusive people. I think Elton John rented it one night, but they charged him like seven thousand dollars for the one night to rent it. So it's like his a room, suite. all in English chins, very chintzy, <laughs> and English. You know how, how the English people were, you know. But and because he used to paint from the balcony. The right. pool and outside, he was a painter. He was. And he liked to sit out on his the terrace out there and paint, and it was gorgeous because he painted the mountains, the Aztec mountains. and mm -hmm. He was a landscape painter. A landscape, yeah. And so that was his favorite hangout then. <laughs> yeah. But it was a wonderful hotel. And then I worked all over uh, Morocco, and then a woman who... Um, used to come into the club and said, someday I'm going to open a, a club called uh, Rick's Cafe and I want you to be my piano player like it is in the film. And I said, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> you know, she used to come by the piano all the time, but she certainly did. She said, it's the 10th year now. This is the fifth anniversary of, uh, and I went for the fifth anniversary and the eighth anniversary. And if my strength holds out, I'll go for her 10th anniversary in a couple of months. Uh-huh. She would give this to the customers of Rick's Cafe. Uh-huh. <laughs> Casablanca. Fifth anniversary. Com commemorative medal. Wow. Loyal client and a true friend of Rick's. And, um, so, uh... That's where my career ended up before I started getting ill at Rick's Cafe. And now, um, well, I'm home, hoping to maybe go back for one more, one more uh, time, but who knows? Who knows? I don't know whether I'll have the strength or not, because the last time I went back, I, uh, they, they sent me first class and I had a wheelchair, wheelchair service all the way, which was very nice, which was very nice. I didn't have to sit up in a wheelchair in the restaurant, but uh, the trip was all wheelchair, mm -hmm. first class, it was wonderful. It's a long flight. A long flight because <laughs> you got to get to New York and then New York. To Casablanca, uh -huh. yeah, exactly, yeah. So tell us about your Dodge commercial. <laughs> the Dodge commercial. Well, I didn't know how I didn't know how famous it was going to get when I made it. Um, I got a call from my agent. Said he wants uh, several people over the age of eighty to tell about how great the Dodge is this is their hundredth anniversary hundred years they've been in business the Dodge people so uh, she called me and she said I want you to say some lines about uh, life and stuff so I gave her some lines which you will hear if when you play the commercial and she liked it and she liked my my, my look and that was it and I never, th I never thought it would uh, cause uh, to be on the Super Bowl and, <laughs> and and everything. So they owed me quite a bit of money because uh, they had uh, paid me for the regular commercial. Mm -hmm. But when I played the commercial, you know, even though I'm not SAG, Screen Actors Guild, they still had to pay me for that extra pump. <laughs> Roy, Roy and, and it went all over the world. Wow. Including Super Bowl, yeah, yeah. and good. that's that. That's the name of that tune. Oh, and uh, somehow in the meantime, you were in Gone with the Wind in 1939. I was in, in 1938 in the film Gone with the Wind. Yeah, I was a glorified extra coming back from the war, and if you Google into uh, the, the Google into um, the story, 
it tells about how I got to the studio set five o'clock in the morning to change into my costume and we're in a big tent and this is the day they're going to shoot Vivian Lee trying to get get back to Tara and she wanted to find her her uh, footman her, not a footman but in those days they didn't call him footman but her helper who was uh, uh, you know who knew all about Tara and was a uh, her man tried to try to get her back there. Well, we all had costumes on because we're coming back from the Civil War. And I had a gash in my head, fake blood, and I had a straw hat on and a thing around my neck, and I'm limping. And she comes, Scarlett Vivian Lee comes up to me and says, How do I get back to Tara? Do you know? I know her. Can you find Big Sam for me? Well, the director said, Letty, don't answer her. Just shake your head, because if you answer her, i got to pay you $300. <laughs> he laughed. I give you a line. Yeah. You get a and I wanted to say, don't laugh, <laughs> sucker. Don't laugh. Give me the line. <laughs> but they wouldn't give me the line, so I just got my regular $33, <laughs> which was a lot of money in those days, because a loaf of bread was five cents in those days, you know. <laughs> but anyway, oh, another thing, when I got on the set to change into my uh, clothes coming back from the war, I had to go make number one, and I stepped outside of my tent, and I saw a whole row of, uh, of porta potties like they have today. Mm -hmm. uh, there were about 300 porta potties. Well, when I got up to the porta potties, about 10 or 15 feet from my uh, where, uh, my tent where I was changing clothes, I saw the signs. It said colored, white, colored, white, colored, white, colored, white, colored, white, all down the lines. And I looked at that and I could not believe it. We're getting ready to go into a war at that time. And I said, oh my God, this cannot be. Anyway, I could not digest, well, I've been a fighter anyway, you know, against that kind of prejudice. I didn't do it down south because I was never raised down south, but with the stuff I ran into here in L.A. was full of it. The people that, that was born and raised down there that came to live here, you right. know, about buying houses or moving into areas where you weren't wanted and all that. Well, to make a long story short, this is all already on the tube. I went to Clark Gable's uh, dressing room, direct, knocked on his door, and his dresser said, Who is it? I said, Will you tell Mr. Gable I, I got to speak to him for like one minute, no more than one minute? And he said, Well, we're making up. I said, I know, but I said, This is very urgent. So uh, Gable said, who is it? And he said, it's the guy that wants to speak to you for one minute. And Gable said, let him in. So the guy opened the door and Clark Gable said, yes, what can I do for you? And I said, Mr. Gable, will you come out for just five seconds and I want to show you something. And he followed me out and he looked up at those signs that said white colored, white colored, white colored, white colored, white colored. And he swore up and down, and he called Victor Fleming, the director, and the property master, and said, if you don't get these GG signs down, you won't have Rhett Butler on this film. And, cause, and I had told all the guys, as they were dressing, about this, and they said, look, we don't care about all that. We got mouths at home to feed. I said, yeah, but you're getting ready to go into a war and get killed, too. And you're going to let them give, tell you where you can do number one, number two? And I said, they, they cannot hire 400 Mexicans to look like blacks, so forget it. So <laughs> that was that. They laughed and said, oh man, you, we're with you, whatever you're going to do. So that, was, that took care of that. Yeah, so uh, Gable saved the day and they took... The signs down, we did number one, number two, wherever. 
<laughs> we needed to. Yeah. It was a great story for him. He was such a nice guy. He really was. So was that being shot uh, just right out here in Culver City? Yes, and, and it's now called uh, Rain Tree County, and it's uh, all condominiums now. Because MGM was going under, under down there, losing money, and they sold that part of the studio. And I, I know that because I used to work on that section of the studio. I did a, the last Tarzan, called Tarzan's uh, something, Tarzan's last something, and it was his last thing. <laughs> was, it, was it Johnny Weissmuller or was it? Johnny Weissmuller. Ah. And they had a big lake on the, with the fake crocodiles. <laughs> And they ask, can you swim, people? They ask us, the black guys, can you swim? And they said, because these crocodiles are real. Now, they weren't real. They had one real crocodile in the whole thing. The rest were all rubber. But the real one they had his mouth, <laughs> had his mouth tied oh, I with see. a big belt. <laughs> yeah. But I, but, I, but I was not good at, in water anyway. But I stayed close to the edge of the... Pond, but that's that was Rain Tree County that they sold off that property. They sold off, and, and there's uh, uh, condominiums there now, mm -hmm. on the corner of West Jefferson and uh, oh, what's that street that goes into Westwood? Yeah, Jefferson and Overland. Overland. Oh yeah, Overland. It would of course, be Overland. It has an yeah, on that corner was uh, MGM's personal property that they sold to raise money for the studio. Mm -hmm. It's now condos called Rain Tree. And the, rain, the reason they named it, named it Rain Tree because that was going to be a film between Elizabeth Taylor and... Uh, Montgomery Cliff? Montgomery Cliff, but he got his face all right. screwed up in New York, crossing the street, and they, they never filmed the film. And that was his, his last... Thing that he was going to do, I think. Well, he had to be uh, reconstructed. Oh yes, it was reconstructed, but it was never. He never looked the never same. Never the same. And I remember him. I, I was doing a private party at Bogart's. It was Christmas Eve, and because and he always told the crowd, "There's only reasons to have this birthday." He said, two people were born on Christmas Eve was Jesus and me." <laughs> Caused quite a laugh, you know. <laughs> oh, he was quite a cut up Bogart, you know. But anyway, uh, something I was going to tell you. Uh, oh, uh, Montgomery Cliff came to the party, and his driver. He opened the door for the driver, and the, he, and the driver helped him out, but he was already tipsy. And uh, Lauren Bacall went to the door to let him in. Because she was going to the kitchen, but she heard the zing, 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 you know. And she opened the door, and she said, Hi, Monty! And he said, Hi, Betty. I know this is going to be a great party. And she said, Yes, it's, it's a great party. And she put her hands on his shoulders, turned him around, pushed him back in the car, told the driver to take him back home. He never got to the party. He was that stoned. What a shame, because he was so good as an actor and as a person, but his things got the hold of him, you know. Mm -hmm. I, he couldn't believe his success, could not believe himself as a man, I guess. I don't know what, you know, and the world loved him. He was so good, you know. Did you ever see him and Elizabeth Taylor in that wonderful film with the... Uh, um, Catherine uh, Hepburn? Huh? The summer, the, what is it called? Suddenly Last Summer? Not Suddenly Last Summer, but that was a good That's one. That's a yeah. good one. <laughs> but no, where uh, uh, Shelley Winters, he got pr her pregnant. Right, right. Um, sun. Something. Uh, Place Something in the time. Sun. Place in the Sun. It's Amer an American, an American some tragedy, but it was called Place in the Sun. Right. Yeah, American tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. 
one of Oh, and he was so ones. young and so fair. <laughs> huh? He was so young and so fair. In and so movie. fair, yeah. <laughs> right. It was, and it's so good in that film. It's, oh, she was yes. so beautiful. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. She was so gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Oh, without even trying to be, she was so beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, right now I can't think of, uh, yeah. But if you Google, there's a lot of stuff on Google, isn't there? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And on YouTube. But the Clark Gable story is on Google. And uh, I'm playing and singing Georgia on my mind on Google. Oh. Yeah, I think that's on there too. We should have those things and cut them in between, Marco. <laughs> So it, uh, you had some photographs that you wanted uh, Marco to look at for you, to scan for you, right? That uh, that you have around your yeah. You, your place is is really really nice. You said you said they have a a spa here and a swimming pool and everything, and it's so nice oh, here they at do. Cedar Lodge. Outside spa. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what do you call them? Jacuzzi. Jacuzzi. <laughs> and I had one in my bathroom. <laughs> And I put too much uh, uh, soap in there, and I couldn't get out. And I and I, and I was, I did a thing on my tailbone. Oh. <laughs> so I had my friend come and cut it up in little pieces and take it out. And I got a beautiful bathroom now. It looks like Las Vegas <laughs> now. And I had him build a seat in there where I could sit down when the time comes where I can't stand. It's gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Now, I was telling you about something else. About Cedar Lodge and what it used to be? Uh, no, because I didn't know much about it then because I was so young. But Max Sennett and uh, Hal Roach and all those big uh, money makers, all those big, uh, uh, Buster, I guess Buster Keaton too, was probably, and all those people that had any money or were, you know, were in that star circle came here and met here and they, they played cards and they uh, did things that guy do, that guys do at lodges in those days, <laughs> you know. Guys probably had a lot of women and blah, blah, blah. Well, the, the, it would have had more grounds then. It would have had more... Uh, uh, Room, not it wasn't all built up around here. Oh no, oh god, no, uh -uh. it was not. But Max Sennett Studios is still down the hill here, right? right. The old Max Sennett, yeah. A, a lot of people came to the Breakfast Club, they would go riding at the Breakfast Club, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I know that. Now, there was something else I was gonna tell you. Um, it's so difficult to remember, but I, I, when you're gone, I'll remember it, you know. I of course. Suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, do you mind if we just ask a couple questions about, like, when you came to Silver Lake? When was the first time you were in this area, like, as a youngster or as an actor? Yeah. When were you first in Silver Lake? When was that first? Yeah. Come to the area here? Oh, I would say I was at the uh, towers, the uh, the towers over on uh, Los Feliz. What's oh, okay. that called? Aren't they Los Feliz towers? Yeah, Los, Los Feliz, Feliz towers. towers. Uh huh. It's a article. Yeah, I always wanted to go where I wasn't wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that would be about uh, oh gosh, about. Uh, Forty years ago, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the uh, homeowners got so expensive, I decided I didn't need the guy to open open my car door and, and uh, bring up my groceries and stuff. I could do that myself. And uh, so I said, I got to get out of this uh, 
homeowner's thing, which was somebody guarding your car and, you know, and all that. You had to pay for all that, you know. The pool and everything is fine. And um, they had a rec room, which is nice, too. But then um, I drove over here and saw what we had here. And all I had to buy was just the condo. The pool was here already, and blah, 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 you know. And it already had a jacuzzi, which I tore out, <laughs> you know. And I didn't have the homeowners, which I had to pay. I have to pay homeowners here, but it was half, less than half of what I was paying over there. So being on a fixed income, I said, no, 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 you know. So that's what happened. And that's in comparison with the towers? Yes. With the Los Feliz Towers? Right. Tower. Well, the towers has kind of, a, I guess, a, a name if, if you're into names and you got to think that you're somebody. But see, <laughs> I don't think like that. I don't need to think like that. I know who I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have to say, oh, I live at the towers, you know. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. So did you ever have... Did you ever own your own home, like a little place somewhere? Oh yes, Where oh was that? yes. I used to, I used to. What do they call it now? When you buy a place and sell it, and you buy flip. Huh? They call it flipping. flip. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing, but <laughs> <laughs> but I used to flip. But I'd fall in love with a place and put carpets in and stuff, put in a lot of old stuff that uh, <clears throat> you shouldn't do if you're going to sell it right away, you know. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I was flipping. I was flipping neighborhoods where they didn't want me. Oh. I used to send in, uh, my cousin, I have a cousin who could pass for white very easily, and I used to send her in with a couple of friends to buy a place where the Jewish people say, oh no, we can't sell. To, to black people, and we're, and we're not going to move, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but um, I got them to not know that it was me. Uh, and one place I bought on the, whole, on the telephone, the whole, I did the whole thing by telephone. <laughs> and they never knew that I was black, I guess, because of my voice. I didn't speak dim, dim, dad, though. <laughs> hello, hello, lady. <laughs> You know, I speak like I speak now, you know, and they never knew that I was not black, and I did the whole thing, and she never knew that I was black until I got ready to move in. And she wanted to know would I pay the commission. She said, Mr. Blewett, you did a fast one on me. She said, I never knew that you were not uh, Caucasian. I said, well, you didn't ask. <laughs> so she said, would you be willing to pay my, com my the commission on the house that I just sold you? I said, absolutely not. And um, the uh, authority, the real estate authority went after her because it was illegal at that time, even at that time, for her to do that and, you know, and keep the house from me and want the commission and all that. So I went through all that, all those games, you know. But it was fun at the time, you know. Yeah. And, and, well, you have a daughter that, uh, does she live in, the, in Silver Lake too? She lives with me here. Oh, she does. Yeah, oh, and she's good. gone to get her hair done. <laughs> Starting about 30 years ago, I used to go down to, to the little, the, uh, little uh, donut shop on the corner of Hillhurst. And Franklin was called Daily Donuts. And I used to go there for a good about 30 years ago. Every morning, read the paper, talk to people, coming and going. And uh, the owners were, were good, good friends of mine, and I still chat with them. They sold it about two years ago to relatives, but uh, we still chat. And, uh, you know, we're still friends, you know. And I took the... the the former owner, a woman, who, who had uh, trouble with her legs to walk, she was on a crutch. I took her to my church, and we all prayed for her, and about a week later she threw the crutch away, 
Yeah, and I was so happy that I took her to the church. And Whoa, I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. I was just over there yesterday to that Daily Donuts. I never knew what you were talking about until yesterday. Did you see my photo on the wall over there? I didn't. I'll have to go again. <laughs> yeah, it's on the wall. It's a popular place. So people yeah. coming in, bringing their kids after school. And right, so oh yeah, exactly. And I, I'm, I've made uh, CDs. And I used to have a big basket that I used oh. to leave on the counter. And I used to charge them, I used to give them a buck for each CD that they would sell. And I did pretty good with them, but I, I lost the desire to, since I had my stroke, I kind of lost the desire to uh, play and sing like I used to because uh, this hand, while I can do a lot of things with it, it's. I still can't get the notes I want to get on the piano and so forth. This left side was affected with the stroke, not this side. I was sitting here like this when the stroke came on and I kept saying, I got to get to bed, turn off that TV. The TV was on. It was a horrible show. <laughs> and I kept watching. I said, what am I sitting here watching this show? Go to bed. Well, this wouldn't work. This hand wouldn't work at all. Finally, I reached over here and I called Frank. Frank came and got me and took me to uh, the hospital. And the rest is history. They put me in uh, the hospital, Kaiser. And then they farmed me out to uh, a company that got me walking again. And then it was horrible because not many of them spoke English. But I'm glad they didn't because that made me want to get out of there. <laughs> and finally I got to uh, the uh, hospital over off an awful, I was going to say Channel 2, not Channel 2. Uh, off of the freeway. The freeway, number two, yeah. Oh, okay. Wonderful hospital, Adventist. Uh-huh, Glendale Adventist. And they got me out of there in two months and it was fantastic. Wow. Absolutely fantastic, yeah. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. What's your church, by the way? Huh? What church do you go to? It's by called the Fame, the First African Methodist Episcopal. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Murray, who was there for years, uh, is not there anymore. He's, he's got a chair now over at USC, the college, and he teaches theology. Mm -hmm. And whenever there's uprisings, everybody goes to that church. To be for and stuff to be settled whenever the racial thing comes up and there's burnings and people are throwing things and you know they come to that church and and uh, they meet there and talk about it and get it get things settled. Dr. Cecil Murray and I'm going to go Sunday because he's going to speak Sunday. Rarely does he go back because he retired after 30 years being there. Mm -hmm. But he's going to speak this coming Sunday of people, of long-time members, which I am one of, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going Sunday. And that's down, uh, is that on Jefferson? Where is that? It's, it's in Jefferson Park. It's on Harvard Boulevard, 2270 South Harvard Boulevard, between... Okay. Adams. It's near Adams. Yeah, between Adams yeah, and Normandy, yeah. Yeah, beautiful church. Mm -hmm. And that used to be the neighborhood we used to call Sugar Hill. That's where all the rich white doctors and lawyers had homes. And we weren't even allowed to even, even cross West Adams at that time, unless you worked there, like in, uh, <laughs> like in, in Glendale. If you weren't out of Glendale by 6 o'clock, you'd got... Not held up, but the nightsticks would, were coming out, you know, in Glendale, unless you worked over there, unless you were, even though you worked, you had to be out of there by six o'clock, you yeah. know. What year would that be? Oh, God, I don't remember. A long time ago. When I was a kid growing up, that would be the 30s. Oh, yeah, yeah. But where this church it was called Sugar Hill and all doctors and lawyers and famous 
people had these big homes there. It was uh, before Beverly Hills was Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. in other words. Then after the war, black people bought there and they're real cheap because the white people moved out because they couldn't find help because the help was that uh, making planes and making right. paint for war effort and stuff. So they had, they had to give up those big houses. There was nobody to clean them. So black mm -hmm. people would rent them. Some would buy, they had the money, they would buy. And some of them would rent out the rooms to people that needed a place to stay. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why it turned all black, you know. Yeah. Blacks ran like crazy as far as they could toward the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Monica got away as quickly and as far away as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? I don't something? know. Uh, well, we do have a question here about what do you think makes Silver Lake special? I guess the location uh, and the hills. The hills are alive. <laughs> With the sound of music, I think, I think a lot of writers and young writers and actors and stuff like these hills here, and they've turned a lot of these houses. People have turned a lot of these houses, private houses, into uh, rentals, you know. And there's a lot of young. It's it's changed in the last thirty years, and a lot of young people have come in with the money and bought property and gathered here on Sundays and it's <laughs> quite a gathering place on Saturdays and Sundays now, you know. Like down at the Triangle Park and, and that yes. on Sunset. Oh yeah. Or like Larchmont too. Mm. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Uh, Lenny, one thing you didn't mention about um, at the Daily Donuts is what a following you have there. Oh. You modestly didn't mention That's how we learned that there about would you. always be that there would always be at least a handful, if not a dozen, people there hanging out with you on those more on those at least six mornings a week. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, because I used to talk to everybody, and a lot of people would sit with me. You know, I, I think Pete Pete Teddy is in the writing group at at, uh, at the Griffith Park Adult Center. He wrote a little oh, yeah. blurb about Pete, you. Pete and his wife, Marianne. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She's an artist. You yeah, know? right. And they, they uh, he he's always bringing art in to the group and showing it. But he but he wrote he wrote a little story about you, and, I was, and and we were all very curious about you. And then uh, that's how we uh, got started thinking. Well, we need to interview this fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he made a violin. He makes instru instruments. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh yeah. He very quietly made a violin down in his basement, worked on it for two or three years, and he would come and show it to me. Oh, I'd go by the place, stop by, and said, how far have you gone now? He said, oh, I got the back all done, and I'm going <laughs> to try to get it together, and blah, 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 you know. Yeah, Pete, Teddy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. And people like that. And um, some of the actors that are doing so well now, like I think of one that used to come in and out all the time, but I can't think of his name. His name will come after you leave. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Is it an Italian name? Uh, no. Uh, he wasn't doing so well for a while, but now he's he's up there. But Leonardo DiCaprio used to come in there when he was eight, nine years old, and the and and Tom Lee Tom Lebon, not Lebon, yeah. I got a wonderful sh shot of Lebon. Oh, I know it's right. Yeah. yeah, we have to scan that. <laughs> uh, but the owner, Tom. Oh, oh, right, right. Okay. His name was. Uh, I call him Tom, and her name is Lynn. Their last name was Lay, L-A-Y. Uh, used to kick him out because at that time the floor was all marble. 
nice marble. I said, get out of here, kid. You're ruining my floor. Get out! And kick him out all the time, you know. Because he lived across the street in kind of a double, uh, like a du duplex, ugly, ugly duplex <laughs> on the corner. And But his mother managed, I, I think, to buy it, but they sold it to the city and the, that's where the library is now. Right. There's a library there. And Leonardo came back to the library and donated $35,000 for uh, computers. And that was his gift for living there and making money and, and leaving, you know, mm -hmm. $35,000 worth of computers he, he uh, bought and gave to the library. Yeah, know. they have a whole special room. Huh? They, they have a special room for yes, computers. It's definitely. not just in the middle yes, of the they library. Yes, do. they do, they do. They do, and Pete, Teddy, and uh, uh, DiCaprio's father are very close friends. Very close friends, great buddies. <laughs> Along with uh, Heidi Fleiss's father, who just died. Dr. Fleiss, right. Yeah. <laughs> Heidi was quite a lady, wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> you might say that. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Well, it does say uh, about restaurants and that you. What What was your favorite restaurant in Silver Lake? It would be uh, the one with a Scottish name. Tam O'Shander. Yeah, it was good for a long, long time. Yeah. And I don't know about now. Oh, still. I imagine it still is. It burned down at one point. Oh, I know. I was here. But Bogart used to sneak in there in the back door and catch the train, Glendale, <laughs> train because he didn't want to fly because of the people reaching out to him and taking photos that he didn't want, you know, taken so, and he could have his big scotch and gin or whatever he was drinking and, and get on, a, on, a, on, a, get on a, a train and go back to New York instead of flying. That was Bogart's uh, favorite place many years ago, many moons ago before. Yeah. Not that far from the station. Huh? Not that far from the station. Not far, exactly, <laughs> yeah, not far from the station. Oh, right. Skipping a jump, really. It's like, <laughs> easy, I've done it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. should we take, oh, did you want to sh uh, tell us about some of your photos? Now sure. that's That's a picture of you Playing the piano in your tuxedo? Yes, in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Oh. At the at the uh, Sheraton Hotel. Ah, okay. That's when I first went to Denmark. Went to Europe in the late seventies, I believe it was. One of them is I made. I don't know whether you remember. Remember Dinah Washington? Mm -hmm. Well, she sang the other one that I wrote, and it says Dinah Washington on there. And that's my brother guarding the Coliseum, the Memorial Coliseum. When he was a policeman, oh, my brother here for like thirty something years, and he retired and moved back to Virginia and built a house back there. Huh. Yeah. Now that picture there is the one, right? Of uh, Bogart and uh, me, yeah. 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 Who's and the lady in that picture? Who's the lady in that picture? Not, 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 um, Lauren Lauren Lauren. Lauren. No, to the left of, of Lauren. That was the one he was married to that he dumped oh. for Lauren Bacall. Oh. The earlier model. Yeah. She was only 19 at the time. Wow. And they married when she was 20. Well, this is a lovely interview. I think we got quite a bit of material. Oh, good. You. Well, great. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. I've lived a long time, seen a lot of things, a lot of changes. Oh, my God. <laughs>